We're going to actually try applying Newton's third law to uh, solving a problem involving multiple objects. In this problem, three masses are tied together using a set of two strings, one here and one here. And in the problem, one is pulling on the third mass with a force F. This could be a string attached to that third mass and pulling on uh, the string with one's hand with a force, applied force F. We'll be asking to solve for a number of the unknowns in the problem, including what is the tension in this string, which we'll call T2, and the tension in this string, which we'll call T1. We'll be given the mass of each of these objects, this mass, this mass, and this mass, we'll call them M1, M2, and M3. And we'll also be asking to solve for the acceleration, A, of the entire system. There's only one acceleration for all three objects here. In principle, you could say there's a separate acceleration for M1, M2, and M3, but because they're tied together and these strings are taut, then the acceleration of each of these three objects will be the same. So we're going to need to go through the six-step system for solving one of these Newton's Law type problems. If you recall, the first step was to draw a free body diagram for each of the individual masses. This means drawing a, a diagram which we, in which we isolate that mass by itself and draw in vector with vectors the forces that act on that mass. The first mass to consider is M1. If you're M1, you don't know about anything else in the system other than you're being tugged on by this string right here. And so there's only one force acting in the horizontal direction, and that's T1. The next mass is M2. If you're M2, you don't really know about the existence of M1 or about M3. You sense a force T2 from this string pulling you to the right and you sense this force from the string uh, with tension T1 pulling you to the left. So you're caught in the middle of a tug of war. That's all you really, really actually know. The next free body diagram is for M3. If you're M3, you don't really know about masses number one and two. Again, you're caught in the middle of a tug of war with a force F pulling you off to the right and a force T2 pulling you off to the left. Those are our three free body diagrams. Now in principle, each of these masses has forces in the vertical direction. There's a mass, a force mg pulling down, and a normal force pull it pushing up so that the object doesn't fall through the table. But in each case, for each of these masses, those parts of the free body diagram are going to be somewhat uninteresting because the objects are not flying off the table or sinking into the table. So this normal force for M2 will exactly cancel the gravitational force downward. And this normal force for M3 will exactly cancel uh, the gra its gravitational force downward. So this normal force for M3 and M2 might be different. And likewise, there would be a separate normal force for M1, and it would exactly cancel the gravitational force down for M1. So there would be three different normal forces, and we would solve for them, but they would not be particularly interesting. Now we need to set up a coordinate system. Since our objects are going to be sliding along the table, it's probably most convenient to set up a coordinate system in which x runs off to the right and y is vertical. All of the motion in the y direction will be zero. There isn't going to be any, and all the action is going to be in the x direction. Step three was to write down Newton's laws, specifically Newton's second law, for each of these objects will have to use some features of Newton's third law in order to make this work go. So for the first mass, this is a very simple equation. We have that mass times acceleration is equal to the net force in the horizontal direction. Now this is really, I suppose I should call this acceleration in the x direction, but it's, there's only one acceleration here. Mass 1 times its acceleration is equal to the net force acting on, on mass 1. Well, if you look at the free body diagram, that's what it's going to tell you what the net force is. There's only one force in this case, it's T1. 
looking at m2, mass times acceleration, again this is acceleration in the x direction, has to equal net force. Because of my coordinate system, x is positive when it points to the right, and so force T2 acting on mass 2 is positive, and I should make force T1 be negative. So I have the net force over here. And this is just Newton's second law, mass times acceleration equals the net force. And since these two work against one another, I have to have a minus sign. For the third mass, it looks a lot like the equation for the second mass. I have m3 times acceleration. Mass times acceleration equals the net force. And in this case, I have a force f pointing to the right, so it's positive. And I have a force t2 pointing to the left over here. And so that's negative. So now I have three equations. If I look at the three equations, I have several unknowns. I have T1, which is unknown. I have T2, which is unknown. And I have this acceleration, A, which is unknown. This is good because I have only three unknowns and I have three equations. So I know that when I have three equations and three unknowns that I should be able to solve everything exactly. Step four is to try to solve these th three equations and three unknowns. I'm going to start working from the, with the masses working from left to right. I already know that with this equation, that uh, an expression for t1, I can say t1 equals m1 times a. So in the second expression, I take t1 and I'm going to substitute for it. That means that instead of T2 minus T1, I'm going to write T2 minus M1A. And this allows me to, re if I regroup, I take this M1A right here and move it over to the other side of the equation. I have an expression T2 is equal to M1 plus M2 times A. So I'm going to park that someplace. That's why I put a little box around it. I still don't know what A is, but I know that once I do find it, I'll know T2. The third expression down here, uh, which I haven't used yet, is M3 times A is equal to F minus T2. Well, now I have an expression for T2. So I'm going to insert for T2 right here and take that down from that boxed expression. And that's going to give me M3 times A is F minus m1 plus m2 times a. Notice I have only one unknown left in this ex expression. That's a here and a over here. So I can regroup and say that f is equal to m1 plus m2 plus m3 times a, or since I want to know what a is, a is equal to f over the sum of all these masses. Actually, that makes sense to me, because if these were not three masses, but rather just one big giant mass whose value was m1 plus m2 plus m3, then the acceleration I should get when I pull on it with a force f should just be the force divided by the total mass of this thing. Now, we're not quite done yet, because we also wanted to know what are t1 and t2. I'm going to remind myself of these, this expression that I was still working on, and this is my finished answer for A. I'm also going to remind myself of this expression, m1 times A is t1, from my previous slide. And I'm going to insert what A is in this expression, because if I insert what A is, then I'll have an expression for t1. That gives me that t1 is equal to f times this big thing here in parentheses. So it's a fraction, f times this fraction m1 over the sum of all the masses. I also know what t2 is because I had an expression for a, and I just needed to substitute in right there, and I'll have what t2 is. So t2 is also equal to f times a ratio 
but it's a different ratio. It's m1 plus m2 over m1 plus m2 plus m3. So in principle, the tension in T2 is a little bit bigger than the tension T1. That makes sense because T2 up here is having to pull both M2 and M1, whereas T1 is just pulling M1. Well, that gets me to my next step, the last step in our problem. We've solved for all the unknowns in the problem, but we should check our work. So I'm going to keep these three expressions over here off to the side, and let's try some limiting cases. Limiting cases means we just take an extreme situation. Now what do I mean by an extreme condition? I mean something where one of these values, m1, m2, or m3, is really, really big, or f is really small, or f is really big, such that I can kind of guess what should happen in that extreme condition. Because part of what's complicated here is that I have three objects, one, two, three, and it's kind of hard to develop an intuition when you have three bodies in the system. But I do have a better intuition about what would happen if there's only one body in the system. So let's try one extreme case where I just simply set m1 and m2 to zero. In other words, there's just one block, m3. If you want, you can think of this as the limiting case where m3 is huge compared to both m1 and m2. In this case, if m1 and m2 were zero, then these strings back here, t1 and t2, should just be hanging limp. And what do I see when I actually plug in m1 and m2 as zero? If I cross it out here, I cross it out there, I get that the acceleration, I get that the acceleration it's just f over m3, which makes sense because I have just one body in the system, and so the acceleration should just be f over m. And notice if I put m1 and m2 are 0, then these expressions for t1 and t2, in fact, give me 0. I can also try to suppose the case where m2 is 0, just m2. That means the mass in the middle. In that case, I just have two bodies in the system, and I can imagine that this is a little bit simpler. In this case, the acceleration just works out to be f over m1 plus m3 because I've gone and looked at the expressions over here and I set m2 to 0. And notice what happens to the two tensions. If m2 is 0, then this is m1 over m1 plus m3, and so is t2 equal to just m1 over m1 plus m3. In other words, T2 will equal T1. That kind of makes sense because when M2 is 0, this is just like having a long string here with a little bead hanging on it. There's hardly any effect of that middle mass at all. So this is just this, it can be viewed as the same string all the way through, and the, the tension should be the same throughout. I could also envision a case where M3 is 0. That's the one hanging out here in the front the one I'm pulling on directly, if I insert m3 is 0 into these three expressions over here, cross it out there, cross it out there, and cross it out there, then what happens? Well, a just becomes f over m1 plus m2. Again, I'm pulling on only two masses, so the acceleration makes sense. And notice what happens to t2. If I have the ratio of m1 plus m2 in the numerator over m2 plus m1 plus m2 in the denominator, and t2 just becomes equal to f. That makes sense again because if I'm getting rid of m3 then it's like that it wasn't, it wasn't there at all and I'm just pulling directly on m2. So what I've achieved by looking at some of these extreme cases is I've given myself a little bit more confidence in the algebra I had to do in order to come up with these three boxed equations over here on the left. And that's important because sometimes we make algebraic mistakes and the limiting cases will reveal to us that something counterintuitive has happened and we probably have made a mistake. So this is meant to exemplify all the steps, 1 through 6, for solving a Newton's Laws problem when there's more than one object in the system. We need to draw free body diagrams for each of the objects. We need to set up a coordinate system that's convenient to work with. We need to set up a set of equations using Newton's second law and possibly Newton's third law that govern the motion for each of the three or more objects in our system. 
and identify what are the unknowns, and hopefully we have the same number of, of unknowns as we have equations. And then finally we need to solve all these equations and come up with uh, the expression for all the things we wanted to know in the problem.